The US does not need India, China and France telling it what to do on the issue of the Paris Climate Agreement, American Ambassador to the UN Nikki Haley said last year. Strongly supporting the controversial decisions of President Donald Trump to withdraw from the landmark accord. Trump last year withdrew the US, the second largest polluter after China, from the Paris Agreement. He said that India would get billions of dollars from meeting its commitment under the 2015 Paris Agreement along with China and gain a financial advantage over the US. He had put the US in the league with two other nations, Syria and Nicaragua, who have not signed onto the deal agreed by over 190 other nations. I think the rest of the world would like to tell us how to manage our own environment and I think that anybody in America can tell you that we are the best to decide what America should do. We don't need India, France and China telling us what to do and what they think we should do," said Halley to a news report. Responding to your questions on the global reaction to Trump decision, Halley said that they should continue doing what's in the best in country's interest, but if the Paris Agreement was something that works for them that they can achieve, they should do it and anyway. Halley defended Trump's suggestion saying that a business could not be run under the kind of regulations imposed by the Paris climate deal. There is a reason that President didn't go through the Senate to get this cleared because he couldn't. The regulations were unattainable, I mean, you couldn't actually have a business run under the regulations that we had said. She also said that the US is conscious about the environment and it will continue to do its part in protecting the climate change. We know that there are issues with the environment. We know that we have to be conscious of it. But we can't sit there and have a Merkel telling us to worry about Africa. She should continue doing her part. We are going to continue doing our part. We are going to continue encouraging other countries to do what they think is in the best interest of them. But American sovereignty matters, said Halley. The top American diplomat said that the Trump believes the climate is changing and now he does know that the pollutants are the part of that equations. He believes that the climate is changing and he believes pollutants are part of that equations. He is absolutely intent on making sure we have a clean air, clean water and that he makes sure that we are doing the everything we can do to keep America the moral compass in the world when it comes to the environment. And also he said at final, we have done that in the past and we will do in the future. It's what the US does, it's what we will do to continue to do. And India, China or any other nations does not want to say or should say what US had to do or what US should do. So what do you think of US warning India and France and other nations in the climate accord which US withdrew last year? The Chinese Foreign Minister on Thursday responded to a statement by its ambassador in India, Liu Haohui, who recently said Beijing is prepared to rename the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or the CPEC to address India's concern. The ministry neither endorsed or neither denied the Liu statement, suggesting that it was encouraging Liu to negotiate with New Delhi over the issues, while ensuring that it did not upset Islamabad either. The ambassador had said during a speech in Delhi last week that China can change the name of CPEC and create an alternative corridor to Jammu and Kashmir, Nadullah Pars, and Nepal to deal with India's concern. In return, it was suggested that India join its One Belt on Road or the Over Connectivity Plan, which desperately needs a boost from China's largest neighbor to its south. Chinese investments in Nepal and Myanmar are meant to pressure India to join the initiative but India has not responded to these overtures so far. The fact that Liu publicly discussed the possibility of renaming CPEC twice indicates that he was acting on the instruction from Beijing and not from expressing his own personal views, said some observers. The foreign ministry said on Thursday. CPEC is an economic cooperation initiative that has nothing to do with the territorial sovereignty disputes and does not affect China's or Pakistan's position on Kashmir's issues. Experts also said that the mention of Pakistan in the statement was significant because Beijing does not want to hurt sentiments in the country until its envoy in New Delhi manages to strike a deal. 
The fact that he is interested in negotiating with India, so said, was evident from a foreign ministry not contradicting its envy in New Delhi. New Delhi believes Beijing has sided with Islamabad by including Pakistan's name in the project, which passes through a portion of Kashmir's described as part of India. At the same time, India's refusal to join the Uber is one of the major hindrances in Uber's growth. Prime Minister of India Mr. Narendra Modi had made this clear when India became the first major country not to attend the Uber Forum in Beijing in May 2017. Whereas most Western countries, including the United States of America, had sent official delegations. China is ready to strengthen the connectivity with all the neighboring countries and promote the regional economic cooperation and common prosperity, according to a translation of the ministry's statement which was released in Chinese. CPEC is a framework for cooperation focusing on the long-term development of cooperation in all fields. It is in the interest of both China and Pakistan. It is also conducive to promoting the regional stability and the development. So what do you think of China is proposing or want India to be in over? Is this a trick or a trap for India to fall in, in Chinese hands or these are really a good cooperation for good economic between India and China? Dar es Salaam on the tropical coastline of East Africa is the heart of Tanzania's economy. With a port that makes it a strategic trade gateway for the region, the city enjoys economic growth averaging 7% per year over the last decade and population growth that classifies it as one of the fastest growing cities in the world. The rapid nature of Dar es Salaam's development has led to many challenges in catering and sustaining its progress. One of the most pressing issues to be addressed is the congestion crisis on road networks. Residents of Dar es Salaam not only waste significant amounts of time, but spend approximately 34% of their average monthly incomes on transport. This limits the resources and productive time available for operating a business. To transform the lives of the workforce and to allow economies of scale to flourish, the city needed enhanced transport facilities that are reliable and cost-effective. The Tanzanian government solution is a high-capacity public transport system with modern buses running on exclusive lanes at the center of major roads. Funding for the critical first phase of the project was provided by the World Bank, allowing it to become a reality by the end of 2015. One of the most critical investments that can be made in Dar es Salaam. Given the, the high rate of growth of the city, nearly 6% population growth a year here in Dar es Salaam, and a population that's projected to reach 10 million people by 2030, and, there, and thereby gain the status of a mega city. And one of the, the, the most important things to get right in a city of this size is to get a, an efficient mass transit system in place to, so that we can begin to realise the productivity of having such a large city here on the coast of Tanzania. It is a system that can transport around 28,000 passengers per direction every hour. And that gives it the potential to become the core public transportation in the city. The first phase of the BRT system which we are supporting here in Dar es Salaam comprises of uh, 20.9 kilometers of trunk routes. It should be carrying up to 400,000 passengers a day. So just about the quarter of all trips uh, happening here in Dar es Salaam will be carried by the BRT phase one. A significant number of people will have their lives improved. We would expect to see on key routes a reduction in travel time for commuters by up to two-thirds or more. Another thing one saves on money, uh, one who would use a fuel for his vehicle, go through the congestion, wake up early, and uh, if you compare that to the price of a trip into the city centre, it's, uh, it's a tremendous saving for commuters. 
one will travel very safely in the buses. It has its own secure lanes and the bus speeds are up to a maximum of 50 kilometers. So it's a very comfortable ride. As planned, it's not just about shortening and improving a daily commute. It can and will do much more. 800,000 job entrants, young men and women, come into the market every year. And they will find economic opportunities as a result of business growth. Now the BRT is excellent for business growth. The BRT system will uh, actually increase mobility here in Dar es Salaam, which actually uh, contributes to the productivity and, uh, you know, uh, the contribution to the economy of the country. There will be opportunities for small businesses, for medium-sized businesses, around the terminals, around the stations, along the corridors of the BRT. All these opportunities have been shown to be delivered in other cities as a result of this kind of mass transit system, they can happen as well in Dar es Salaam. And this is just the beginning. As the next phases of the project are realized, the city's residents will be even more empowered to make Dar es Salaam a place of endless opportunities. A city that can reach its true potential. A city that makes its economic mark on a global level. If you're working in international development, you're in constant need of reliable and timely data. Data on how to improve your programs and how to increase your impact. About what people think and what they do. About their health, their wealth and their consumption. In short, data about the daily lives of those who should benefit from your programs. Traditionally, these kind of data have been obtained through face-to-face -face interviews with a large number of respondents but sending teams of interviewers into remote rural areas is costly, time-consuming, and sometimes dangerous. Furthermore, in times of crisis and mass migration, it might simply be impossible to trace down respondents to interview them again. Thankfully, technology has come to the rescue and is now complementing traditional face-to-face -face interviews. With the rise of mobile phones in many developing countries, it is often no longer necessary to visit and revisit respondents in order to track changes in their lives. Data can be acquired much quicker, reducing both costs and turnaround times. The World Bank's Listening to Africa initiative showcases this enormous potential of mobile data gathering. Partnering with national statistical agencies and NGOs, the World Bank is piloting to collect data through mobile phone surveys in six African countries. Respondents are provided with mobile phones and a solar charger if necessary. Interviews are conducted by trained professionals working from dedicated call centers. Small incentives in the form of credit top-ups are transferred to respondents after each completed interview. This encourages respondents to participate in the survey and to keep their phones charged. The initiative is already seeing results. In Madagascar, we tracked in real time how increasing food insecurity is affecting the most vulnerable citizens. And in Togo, we were able to monitor the frequency of power cuts that households were experiencing in the country's capital. Post your comments below and if you like this video, please give a thumbs up and follow us on social networks and subscribe to our channel. And thanks for watching. This is WC Daily. Think big, think different. Bye.